Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Jared Lee. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, the RAL seminar series um, here on April 21st. Hope everyone's uh, staying warm despite the uh, wintry conditions outside here in Colorado. Um, and just some housekeeping details. Um, and also, Vitaly, if you could move back to your, um, your title slide. Um, so just some housekeeping details here. Um, so everyone in the Zoom room here is going to be uh, muted through the duration of the seminar. And after the seminar, um, you'll be free to unmute your camera and your mic to ask a question. However, we do ask uh, to, um, as in an in-person seminar where you raise your hand, we do ask that you use, um, those of you in the Zoom room, to uh, use the raise hands feature. So down at the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll see a reactions button if you click that. Uh, then you'll also see the, the raise hand feature. So um, we do ask that you do that so that we can uh, call on everyone, hope to everyone's questions. Um, I believe that's uh, all I have for housekeeping for now. So now I'd like to... Eric, are you there? Sorry, you uh, muted it or your your sound went out <laughs> before I got to the end, so I wasn't sure if you were finished. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, I'd like to welcome Vitaly Holodovsky, um, who's a PhD candidate from the University of Maryland in the Atmospheric and Oceanic Science Department. And his research interests include analysis, modeling, and verification of extreme events um, by applying statistical and machine learning algorithms. And he visited me here at NCAR uh, back in 2018 as part of the ASP graduate visitor program. Um, and we worked on statistical analysis of extreme events and spatial forecast verification uh, work. Um, this talk that he's giving today is based on a paper that was just now hot off the press published. Uh, so following in our tradition of this new uh, seminar series um, in the last one that I gave, I also had just uh, published a, a paper in the same journal. Um, and it's, uh, the paper is called a generalized spatiotemporal threshold clustering method for identification of extreme event patterns. And uh, the journal is advances in statistical climatology, meteorology, and oceanography, or ASMO for short. Um, and just as a last thing, the, the ASMO journal was, uh, is a new journal, relatively new journal that was started by, um, the, through this uh, Statmos networking grant that NCAR was a part of uh, back when it was still on. Um, so with that, I'll um, hand it over to you, Vitaly. Hello. Um, thank you, Eric, for the... Hello. Thank you, Eric, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you, Enka, for the opportunity uh, to share my research. And like, as Eric mentioned, I'll be talking about... Uh, uh, the methodology that we just published in a uh, AMSOC magazine, you know, journal, uh, and it's called Generalized Special Temporal Threshold Clustering Method for Identification of Extreme Events. And basically what is uh, uh, boils down to that we're interested in uh, detecting um, uh, large special temporal patterns, and we're also interested in automating the process for uh, selecting thresholds for those patterns. Um, so the key challenges, uh, the motivation actually for my, uh, uh, for my talk uh, uh, is as follows. Everyone knows that extreme events uh, can cause substantial damage in terms, in terms of human lives, financial losses, and loss to the infrastructure. And as climate changes, it's important to understand how extreme weather events may change as a result. Um, unfortunately, many of these phenomena occur at the scale too fine to be properly resolved by global climate models, uh, for example, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, high winds. And to more accurately evaluate large scale processes, the climate model projection needs to be compared with observation both in space and time 
but properly constructed, constructed extreme event uh, verification measures. And lots of those measures, uh, um, uh, I think Eric uh, covered uh, in his uh, uh, past uh, uh, talks and his uh, uh, um, number of publications. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is no uniformly accepted definition of extreme events. Um, but once it's identified, it's hard to link those events to large scale physical processes. And the process of identifying of extreme events has been typically uh, based on classifying them into groups with characteristics such as uh, frequency of occurrence, intensity, temporal duration, and timing. And uh, evaluation of the multidimensional nature of extreme events in most cases has been uh, confined to individual grid points or stations, thus overlooking embedded special dependency. I guess this is true for the uh, uh, analysis extreme event and uh, keep me almost thinking about this uh, uh, situations. Um, so the outline of my talk is as follows. First, I'm gonna mention what we mean by the extreme uh, in our paper. Uh, I also touch on what uh, other people uh, define extreme events, why it's important to um, as a formalized process for defining extreme events, specifically for uh, comparing uh, uh, extreme event studies between different modeling groups. I then go summarize the algorithm structure, which consists of the main five steps. I then uh, will describe our, describe our main findings and uh, uh, applications of the algorithm. Uh, so how is the extreme event is defined? Um, according to IPCC, extreme event is the occurrence of the value of weather variable above or below threshold value near the upper or lower ends of the range of the, uh, its observed values in a specific region. As you can see, the extreme event definition is tied up to the threshold. However, there is no really um, um, definition of what kind of threshold should be. It should be a very large th threshold on how large it should be, if it's percentile, how large the percentile should be, and so on. Um, so obviously within scientific literature, we have different definition of what the extreme event is. For example, uh, we can think of the extreme as a maximum temperature during the year, or we can think of 95th percentile of annual precipitations. And we have lots of uh, scientific papers published that uh, specifically using those definitions. We can also think of extreme event as a maximum length for the wet Think of extreme as events as making $1 million in the stock market, but uh, uh, um, they're all extreme events. Uh, you know, it's obviously, it's nice to have a, a consistency, objectivity, and extreme threshold determination. So we can all compare the extreme events and understand uh, um, how they are changing as, as a result of the climate change. Um, in uh, um, statistical uh, uh, literature, specifically in extreme value analysis, the uh, selecting a threshold is a challenge. All, uh, it's based on uh, what is called bias and variance trade-off. Uh, for example, if the threshold choice is too, too low, the statistical model likely will not have a good fit to the axis above the threshold, leading to bias. And conversely, if the threshold is too high, only a small number of accidents will be generated, leading to the higher variance in the estimators. Um, our threshold selection algorithm consists of five main steps. So if we uh, think of the threshold as a, as a uh, interval where you can break up uh, uh, our threshold uh, range from very low, like starting, let's say, from theta one to the very high theta n, then uh, we look at this uh, uh, and try to select what would be appropriate threshold for the particular extreme event analysis. So we have a five step. Step number one, essential field quantity. And this is new term, and I describe uh, what it means. It's closely matched to the uh, time frame of interest. Uh, second step is dimension reduction that is based on statistical quantiles. Third step is a special domain mapping represented by geometric indices. We have a fourth step as a time series clustering. And finally, fifth step is threshold selection. In this setup, the extremeness is determined by an underlying demonstrating. Uh, uh, our results uh, based on the precipitation data, 
Uh, this is the intensity that's coming from GHC and daily data set from NOAA. This uh, basically station-based uh, uh, data set for um, uh, CONUS domain that we selected. We also um, uh, adjusted those uh, uh, station data uh, based on PRISM for the elevation adjustment. And then we grid it to the 30-kilometer uh, uh, grid set. So that's, uh, we, we have approximately 8,500 station records from 1961 to 2016. Uh, which resulted about 27,000 special points uh, with uh, each point having over 20,000 days of temporal rainfall coverage. So from now on, I'll be working only with the greater data set going forward. Um, so what is the essential field quantity construction? What do I mean by that? Well, um, think of about uh, any variable, atmospheric or non-atmospheric variable of your interest and we're trying to decide um, how are we going to approach analysis of the extreme events. Well, I can certainly work with the raw value of the variable. Then uh, I guess I should think about if the seasonality is the issue here, or I can somehow uh, standardize or normalize this variable. So that become uh, something uh, different than the original variable, but still I can do this from my analysis. I still have to make a decision, to, am I interested for the variable uh, uh, values on the uh, lower or uh, upper uh, quantiles of distribution. I also have make a decision, uh, do interested in um, daily value or it should be, uh, they should be accumulated over a certain period of time. So the, all those important decisions that come to the research once you start looking into it. So we call this uh, uh, process constructing or what they call essential field quantity because it's to include any variable of your interest. It could be standardized, normalized with the algo, you know, with the different accumulation windows, algorithms flexible to incorporate all those values. In this particular study, we selected um, uh, no accumulation windows, meaning that we are working only with daily data. And um, we uh, selected higher quantile, or 95th uh, percentile as a higher quantile. So our interest is in the short term, uh, um, daily extreme rainfall events, and those are uh, basically very impactful uh, events that could cause a, a major uh, flash flood in some areas. Um, the second step, so once you de uh, um, determine what is your uh, essential field quantity, and I will call this EFQ, this is a, a abbreviate for short, uh, we need to select the, how we're going to select extreme for the a large universe of daily value. Uh, obviously, you all know that uh, uh, precipitation data set is not uh, normally distributed. It has many multiple days, so there is no observations at all, no rainfall at all. Uh, and how are we going to deal with this? What we call is a dimension reduction step should take care of these uh, situations. Uh, first, uh, we are looking to construct some a summary measure of the um, uh, spatial uh, distribution of the uh, um, uh, rainfall uh, um, events, uh, we will construct the univariate uh, time series, what's called JT, and I'm going to explain later on uh, what it means and how it's done. But for now on, just think about we're taking a 99 percentile in space over that EFQ. Um, and then we call positive extreme field is that any field at time when this univariate time series values is larger than its 95th percentile taken over time. And alternatively, is uh, if our interest lies in the, um, on the left side of the distribution, basically we're interested, for example, in the droughts, then we can also define negative extreme field. It's just uh, any field at time when JT, the senior time series, is smaller than its 95th percentile taken over time. So what, what I'm going to do now is that uh, give us some larger overview. Basically, end result of the algorithm is that we will be interested in finding this threshold theta H uh, from the algorithm that is, in this case, these values of the positive extreme fields are greater than this theta H for the frequency calculation F, which is conditional on this uh, uh, positive extreme event H. So to do that, let me uh, give you some details on how it works. Imagine we have a special field through time. Think of this as any, uh, uh, this um, uh, rectangle in, in a picture representative special map. So we have a number of those maps. We have daily maps from 1960, uh, 1961 to 2016. 
Um, and then with this given these maps, we try to reduce direction by calculating a single summary measure of the EFQ or the special field in order to obtain univariate time series JT that summarizes this, uh, um, uh, this special field. For example, we, in our paper, we can take um, 99 percentile in space. And once we did that, this is we come up with univariate time series that can look like that, represent for the all individual um, um, special points. And given this special, uh, given this univariate series JT, we're trying to select uh, values that is greater than certain uh, function lambda. And this certain function lambda could be, uh, depends on your um, research interest. For example, it could be a mean, could be an average. In our case, we selected 95th percentile. So basically what we do here, we take a 95th percentile from this univariate JT and what those values that are greater than this 95th percentile, what we call, we call them a positive extreme field H, the one that I just have in formula. So the end result here is basically we, we're coming up with certain subset uh, H of the original data set. And this is gonna be our positive extreme field. And from now on, we'll be conditioning our frequency on these positive extreme fields. So we'll be working only with this positive extreme field. And it's really what's left that we need to determine threshold that we're gonna be using for frequency calculation, which frequency works for uh, individual grid cell for the uh, positive extreme field. Examples of the dimension reduction uh, uh, step, what can we discover? Basically with this particular data set, with different accumulation window, we'll be able to uh, detect uh, uh, super, storm, super storm Sandy um, and great flood of 93. Uh, those are the obviously uh, positive extreme events. And for the negative extreme events, we'll be able to detect uh, 2002 drought and 1988 drought. So think about this, our data set now consists only of those positive extreme events, could include great flood of 93, could include super, super storm Sandy, could include any other uh, uh, big events. Next step is the special domain mapping. We use uh, uh, geometric indices uh, to discover topology of the um, spatial field. In this case, the spatial field is a binary image. This is similar binary uh, analysis that Eric de described in his uh, uh, talk, a previous talk. Um, uh, that, that, you, that you guys have uh, in participated. So basically values, uh, the, this geometric index is all value between uh, zero and one. Uh, we selected, uh, um, uh, I guess it's mainly four geometric indices, but we're working with three. First one is connectivity index. This index shows interconnection between individual grid cells. Uh, second is the shape index, which is distinguishes between strip shape and uh, circular shape uh, patterns. We have area index that determines degree of pattern dispersion. And we have complexity index, which is just a complement of the area index. So for our clustering, uh, next step cluster analysis, we'll be working with connectivity index, shape index, complexity index, and the uh, area itself, not the area index. So it would be four different um, uh, geometric property series that we work with. And to just show you an example, this is typical evolution for our data set for this uh, geometric indices. You can see the uh, connectivity index in orange color, or the uh, if you cannot see it color, I pointed my uh, uh, cursor here. That you see how it starts low and then kind of uh, flattens down and goes slightly high. Then you can see a shape index right here, which is constantly going down for large data set. And almost reverse image of it is the uh, complexity index, which with, with, uh, goes up. And the way to understand this is that. If the connectivity index C index is uh, close to one, uh, we have the more connected um, a pixel in, in a, a, a spatial domain. If it's closer to zero, they're more dispersed. For the shape index, uh, very closer to one means that we, we have more circle shape patterns versus zero when we have more strip shape patterns. For the complete complexity index, Y minus uh, A index, if it's closer to one, we have a less structured pattern. If it's closer to zero, we have more structured pattern. And this is uh, just to show you some of the 
uh, examples, uh, courtesy of Eric, on, on how to basically understand those uh, connectivity, connectivity indices. In, in this uh, cartoon, you're going to see this uh, basically larger value will correspond to darker colors, and the smaller value or medium values correspond to uh, lighter colors and uh, uh, very light kind of a blue colors here in this case. So for example, if you have a one circular pattern, uh, then connectivity index obviously would be equal to one, shape index to one, and complexity equals to zero. If we decrease size of this circular pattern, we'll observe that connectivity and shape index and the complexity are still all the same. They not really depends on this particular size of this uh, uh, circular pattern. If we change circle to oval, uh, then we'll see connectivity index still one, but the shape index uh, getting uh, less than one and complexity still at zero. If we add additional uh, uh, circular shape pattern, we're gonna observe that connectivity index getting lower, shape index and complexity index getting high. If we add more pattern, uh, this is uh, basically the, uh, the patterns uh, from previous uh, um, pictures are continuous. The connectivity index getting low, shape index much lower, and the complexity is much high. And then if we spread down, spread them out more, we're going to see that connecti connectivity index also decreasing, shape index near zero, and the uh, uh, complexity index near one. And to show some of the more extreme kind of cases, how the indices behave, if we have now square shape pattern, the connectivity index uh, is uh, equals to one, shape index near zero, complexity index near zero as well. Uh, if we have empty pattern and no data points uh, equals to one, then we see connectivity index and complexity index und undefined, but uh, shape index uh, uh, equals to zero. Again, if we have an oval, you'll see this value for the connectivity shape and the complexity indices. If we have entire pattern, uh, with the uh, grid points uh, equals to one, we see the sh uh, connectivity index equal to one, shape index near zero and complexity index near, near zero. And if we have the more spread out patterns, combination of circle, circling and oval shape patterns, we see that connectivity index is near zero, shape index is near zero and complexity near one. And uh, we have uh, kind of like a, uh, circular pattern of the different uh, circles, we'll see that connectivity index much lower, shape index near one, and complexity index near one. So hopefully this could give you some idea on these cartoons, how those indices behave in those very uh, 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 simple uh, situations. Next here is clustering. Um, so what do we cluster here? Basically we are clustering those geometric uh, 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 attributes, uh, which is the function of thresholds. At the end of the talk, I, I, I discussed that we break out those uh, uh, different geometric patterns, given the threshold value. So we have a distribution of different uh, geometric indices based on the threshold. And this setting, the selection of the threshold is also uh, challenging. It's, um, uh, it's a new term, but which what we call this is uh, um, connectivity in area, uh, Basically, sorry, it's called connectivity in area uh, uh, trade-off. Basically, what it what it uh, means is that in cases involving both relatively low and very high threshold value, connectivity index is close close to one. The higher the threshold value, the smaller the area of the non-zero grid points, as as you would expect. Ultimately, if your threshold value is very high, you're not going to have any uh, grid cells to analyze. But ultimately, we need to find a threshold value that is high enough to be practical to determine large scale special patterns, but not too high to cause the connectivity index to get closer to one and the area of the non-zero pixel to be close to zero. So basically this is the challenge in, and, um, and uh, uh, our um, goal for the time series clustering steps. And um, to evaluate the performance of the clustering algorithm and the resultant geometric properties of the conditional frequency of extreme FQ, we characterize the results in the following manner. We um, break out, as, as you all know, in any cluster algorithm, you need to select number of clusters. And this is the challenging task. How we selected three clusters, but given uh, justification of selecting three clusters in the paper. So I'm not gonna uh, talk about this, but uh, 
I give a description of the clusters that we uh, selected. The first cluster, so we call it low thresholds cluster. Uh, this is where expected both higher value for the connectivity index and the area of non-zero points and the probability of simultaneous extreme events at two different special locations is relatively high. The second uh, cluster we call intermediate thresholds cluster. We expect to have uh, uh, in somewhat intermediate values basically between the first and the third clusters for the area of non-zero uh, grid cells. The connectivity index in this cluster is greater than zero and less than one half. And their threshold values from this cluster can be potentially used for the modeling in extreme value theories in conjunction with other statistical diagnostic tools. The probability of simultaneous extreme events at two different special locations is decreasing. And lastly, the third cluster we call higher threshold cluster, where we expect small value for the area of non-zero uh, grid cells. The connectivity index is greater than zero. And the probability of simultaneous extreme event at two different special locations is relatively low. And so here's uh, how you can uh, uh, visualize this information. Think of this, this is the uh, evalu evolution of the connectivity shape and the complexity index here. And then we could uh, uh, see on the x-axis the threshold. So this is values of the those indices. So you see the evolution of the three geometric indices, the function of threshold. And this potential is the threshold from the first cluster. And that we, I tell you later how we select those thresholds. This is threshold theta two from the second cluster, which cover certain the uh, values, or I should say, geometric attributes from you know, areas around here. And then we have a, a finally a threshold uh, from the uh, last third cluster that could uh, look like this and would cover you know, kind of area uh, above the threshold so over here. Um, so uh, what we do with clustering step, obviously you need to determine what the clustering algorithm you're going to use. We selected partition around the midoids. Uh, and again, justification of that you can find in the paper. Uh, we selected, uh, as I mentioned, three clusters, low threshold, intermediate threshold, and high thresholds. And then what's important for any clustering algorithm, we have to select distant metrics uh, that in our case, we selected distant metrics that are based on autocorrelation and, and partial autocorrelation functions given this um, nice formulas. Um, and the algorithm basically has two phases. And now I'm describing the... Uh, uh, cluster algorithm very generally. It has the two phases, build and swap. In the first phase, K representative objects are selected to form an initial clustering set. In the second phase, attempt is made to improve clustering by exchanging selected and unselected objects. Basically, the objective of PEM is for all selected clusters to minimize average similarity between their center located representative object and any other object in the same cluster. Uh, what's nice about this algorithm that is preserve observational features of the data set, which is essential for clustering of extremes. And for those who know, we didn't select that algorithm because it's using averages, which is obviously uh, uh, somewhat just dest 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 destroy the uh, overall structure of the extreme events. Uh, next, we use the Ciliad coefficients. Uh, which is useful criterion for determining how similar an object and its own cluster compared to other clusters. Uh, this is the formula for the uh, silhouette coefficient where we have uh, a numerator is the difference between the minimum average distance of object I to all other objects in the given clusters not containing I and the average similarity of the object uh, I to all other objects in its clusters divided by the maximum of those two, uh, uh, two metrics. Um, for those who don't know what, what, how, how to read this uh, select coefficient, basically select coefficient values varies between minus uh, one and one, where negative value is undesirable. Again, it measures how well those uh, cluster are selected or separated. Uh, so range of select coefficients closer to one, <coughs> excuse me. indicates that the strong structure has been found in value uh, greater than, uh, um, smaller than uh, 0 
no substantial structure has been found. Some people has a much finer uh, distribution silhouette coefficients. However, they only are, they are, most of them are applicable for when you're clustering actual spatial object and not time series clustering. So we, we just decided to uh, limit ourselves to this uh, type of uh, qualification, classification. And um, last step is the threshold selection, which is our final step formula that uh, I talk about at the beginning of my slide, slides. Basically, the way we discover, uh, determine the threshold, we actually select maximum of the silhouette coefficient between, for the PAM algorithm between, uh, I'm sorry, for the PAM algorithm with either um, distance determined with the uh, autocorrelation or partial autocorrelation. So selected maximum of the silhouette coefficients in this step. Then we select midoid. What midoid is, it's basically a representative object of the cluster. So every cluster has, a, we have number of uh, members and midoid is basically a representative object of those members. And in this kind of you know, case, it could be, you know, midoid linked to this threshold theta one for the first cl cluster and, and so on. So we select midoid in our case, we are selecting midoid from the intermediate second cluster. Again, this is how I explained before to deal with the uh, connectivity area trade-off. So from now on, our extreme value analysis will be only based on the uh, midoid or thresholds from the second cluster. And then when we match in the midoid to the uh, threshold, we get in the threshold because everything is linked. And from now we have a basically threshold that we can use for the extreme value analysis. <clears throat> we also have a specific geometric properties for that particular midoid, which is very beneficial when you do extreme value analysis because you don't know what your properties are for set. Now we do know what our properties are of the geometric indices. We know what connectivity index look like. We know what the shape look like. We know what the complexity look like. We know what the area is. So this is very useful when you do uh, forecast where Um, how the uh, extreme events look like. So if once we know that our threshold, I call this theta H, but again, this is the theta two from this, uh, um, from this picture, we calculate this uh, frequency of the, uh, uh, across all spatial location. And that frequency would be that what we will be analyzed further. So we now on, we just think of our spatial image will be consist only from those conditional frequencies of extreme precipitation where they condition on the positive extreme field. Here are some of the results of the clustering algorithm. This is when we broke our data sets by seasons. Uh, you see the four seasons, so winter, uh, spring, summer, and fall. This is uh, cluster one, this is second cluster, this is third cluster. Just giving an idea how the thresholds are, are different. This is, uh, um, uh, there is no units here because we uh, standardized the data set. So this, as you can see, they have a lower threshold in the first clusters, you know, a slightly higher threshold in the second cluster, and much higher threshold in the third clusters. And in this uh, settings, the threshold choice is linked to the image topology because we know, we know all the geometric properties uh, based on our clustering algorithm, which allow users to make more informed uh, um, decision. This is how that uh, analysis look uh, graphically. You can see that again, this uh, data set is broken by seasons on the left. You see four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Then you see the clusters. It's a lower threshold, intermediate threshold, and higher threshold. So this is analysis based if we cluster for the entire data set. And this is the, again, frequency of the extreme distribution of the extreme uh, uh, events condition on the fields being the law, we call them uh, positive extreme field. The uh, scales here this is the percent, this is the frequency. As you can see, as you go from left to right, you'll see how that, for example, pattern in the, you know, on the uh, west coast of the United States gets smaller and smaller because we're going higher and higher in the threshold phase. And um, uh, we selected, like I pointed out, intermediate threshold cluster for the extreme event. But uh, users certainly can select other clusters if they're. Um, analysis and goals for their analysis is different. So our main findings of this basically are as follows. We propose integrated framework to formalize extreme threshold selection in both space and time. 
We link threshold choice with image topology, which is applicable in identifying extreme episodes in space and time. It can also be used in special forecast verification for extreme events. The algorithm offers greater flexibility and more informed decision than traditional grid point by grid point uh, uh, methods and the best applicable uh, to the spotlight special patterns, such for example, hurricanes, the monsoons, uh, and so on. Um, this is one of the applications that we uh, post in our paper of this algorithm. In these applications, we um, stratify data set by, by year, so not seasonal, you know, by years. And what we actually interesting to discover, uh, we discovered that there is a trend in the connect, downward trend in the connectivity index uh, for the annual precipitation uh, uh, data set. And you can see how that basically graphically that particular uh, graphical property differs. In this case, and I didn't show the formula of connectivity index, but basically connectivity index um, has uh, two main parameters, which is N is number of connected clusters and M is number of non-zero grid cells. And you pay attention to the N because this is primarily, this downward trend is actually based on this parameter N. As you can see, we, we start with the N like 30 and 42, 36, and you can see that uh, our end here is getting larger and larger, indicated that large special, uh, um, large special uh, patterns for the frequency of extreme precipitation uh, breaking down. So their connectivity index getting more dispersed and widened. So, uh, and uh, we're still trying to explain this physically, what actually happened, but I just wanna point it out, this is uh, uh, some interesting results and applications that come out from the our algorithm. Um, so basically I introduced uh, this new algorithm, new terminology and the applications of the algorithm. Just uh, name a few new terminology or new terms that uh, if you are interested in uh, analyzing extreme or similar, you can all use in your uh, papers. We talk about what essential field quantity is. We talk about positive extreme events, positive extreme field, negative extreme field, connectivity area trade-off, low intermediate high threshold clusters, and uh, we have discussed one application, but in our paper, we discussed multiple application of this algorithm. Uh, so this is the summary of the paper. Eric mentioned it should come out actually today, which was the great uh, timing. Um, and the same uh, journal that uh, Eric also has uh, his publica recent publication on the verification measures. And I thank you for your all for your attention. Also, thank you my sponsors here, NOAA, uh, NKSM, and the Global Steward for uh, sponsoring me and thank you NCAR for having me and the uh, opportunity to share my research. And now we'll take uh, your questions. Yeah, thanks, Batali. And um, so, yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, I know it's a, a lot of stuff, a lot of new things in there. Uh, so just raise your hand. No waiting. <laughs> oh, somebody, so Sue Ellen would like um, you to paste the DOI, um, I assume of the paper, Sue, uh, into the chat, if you could do that. Oh, yeah. Yes, there. please. I, that would be really nice. OK, let me, I'm not sure if I can do this. You're going to need to stay on slideshow. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll type it in. Thanks, you, Jared. You, you can't copy and, can't copy and paste from a, a in present mode. So I'll just, I'll just <laughs> type it in. You want me to do it or you can do it? There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Got it, thanks. Uh, let's see, it looks like Casper has a question. Go ahead, yeah. Casper. Hi, Vitaly, this is Casper. We, I think we, we chatted back oh, in 2018 a little bit. Um, at the very beginning of your presentation, yes, we did. link to um, the, the dollar signs as one way of looking at a definition towards extremes. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. Given this approach, would it be possible to 
replace space with a weighted space by um, things that could be put in danger by the extreme. So the value on the ground that could be affected by these extremes. And so therefore all your calculations could continue, but space as it is physical could be replaced by value on the ground. So that a drought in an area where nothing is grown um, might have a, a much smaller spatial representation, whereas areas with very high value, de high dependency on the rainfall um, could, could be enlarged artificially in that sense. Do you think this might be possible? Because I think for impacts that are threshold dependent, um, there will be a, a drastic difference mm. where that impact really manifests itself. It's not just physical when we are interested from a meteorological perspective of how much rain per square meter, but- right. Yes, uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, and and uh, I mentioned this, this is not necessarily applicable to the atmospheric variables, but can be non-atmospheric variables. So as long as we can uh, uh, work with the uh, gridded data set, that algorithm uh, uh, will be applicable. Yeah, it seems like you Did could that, define... uh, say... Oh, sorry. <laughs> it seems like you could define your positive extreme field in such a way as to weight the different locations and um, differently depending on the uh, vulnerability, I suppose, of, of yeah. the area. Is that yeah, in some mean? sense, yes. exactly. But then retain your your instruments of using the spatial characteristics of this, right, to, to mm -hmm. in order to distinguish what, what, what happens. I think that might be an interesting approach. Yeah, it's a good application. Uh, if, we, like I said, this is, uh, if we can try to, you know, have a grid this, uh, you know, I guess you're interested in, uh, uh, um, I guess, valuation, for example, of the different, uh, grid cells, right? For given the, you know, certain impacts or what the, or actually what are the values would be, let's say, let's a real estate in that particular, you know, area. Uh, if you, you know, if you can grid those uh, data set, then we can apply this algorithm. Yeah. Thanks. And find the, and find the area with the, you know, uh, extreme, uh, um, I, I guess, extreme damage that, that could happen during the, uh, extreme events. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question. Sure. Any other questions out there? Um, I suppose if not, then, uh, oh yeah, no, here we are. Sue has a question. Go ahead, Sue. Okay, thanks for the interesting talk. I mean, this um, looks like a really useful technique for identifying extreme events and, and trying to understand them better. Could you use it for forecasting in interesting ways? I mean, it seems like you're, by identifying the extreme events, it's kind of along the same lines as some of our regime dependent forecasting. And of course the extreme events are the hardest to forecast. So just like to pick your brain a little bit there. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the, for the question. Um, so this work only based on the observations. To have a forecast, uh, and, and uh, actually we working with Derek on this, we, we have to find a suitable model to uh, be able to represent those patterns that we uh, uh, see in observations. We already have the model uh, kind of in mind that we could use to model those special temporal processes. And once that model is, uh, uh, I guess, once we test that model more accurately, we certainly can use the, uh, for forecasting, but I think in more in terms of, uh, since it's a statistical model, we're talking about return periods. We're looking at the, you know, decades and, and, and a larger type of the forecast. Is that, is that right, Eric? Um, yeah, I think so. I think um, if I understand where Sue's coming from here, I, I think, you know, we have these sort of, uh, what do we call it? Uh, what's the word? 
begins with an A. I know some people at NCAR did or do or used to do or um, some of these forecasts where you identify um, analogous. Oh, analogs, yes. Yeah. Analogs, yes. <laughs> oh, maybe analogous. Analogs. I, I think you could. And, and. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I would just want to add uh, uh, to your to our comments. Also, you certainly can use this to uh, uh, do the you know forecast verification with your prediction models. There's ultimately you don't have to do anything just to uh, you know identify those extreme events in observation and see if those events are properly identified in your forecast model, and then you would apply uh, a forecast verification measure uh, and uh, uh, applicable to the extreme and you know, perhaps something similar that uh, Eric was talking about uh, uh, last uh, uh, seminar. And if you could then identify how the models have done versus the extremes, and if, you know, again, ex the, the nature of extremes, it doesn't happen often enough, but if you could determine right. the bias for the specific extremes, then it seems like we might have a technique to do a differential correction for those extreme events. Right, yeah, that's right. I don't know, I, I, you know, we have some folks on here, Jim Cowie, um, I, I, I don't know if there's any way to blend that kind of thing into say a die cast as a special type of, um, you know, correction that would be different. Yeah, I'd have to think about that myself. I, I don't know, Vitaly, if you, but uh, just thinking about the, the method is sort of, it's very distributional, you know, in the sense, so it's very suited to climate because mm -hmm. of that. Um, so I'd have to think about if there's a way to, to use that information. I expect there could be, you know, like I say, in this sort of analog kind of, kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, but you, I mean, you can certainly, you know, verify your weather forecast in a distributional sense as well so mm -hmm. and improve improve the calibration that way perhaps what do you think Vitaly? does this answer your question so i think as as much as i can i see jim unmuted but i i sorry to put you on the spot jim go ahead jim <laughs> If he's there, sorry, my was on the wrong, the wrong. I was speaking, but nothing was getting through. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So as as Sue was saying um, in diecast, I think extreme events are probably the weakest part of diecast. I think it tends to um, really kind of munch things together and, and in a way average things together. But so really, the way to do that. Um, we really probably have to be doing some kind of analogs and uh, what you were just discussing, um, which is really a, a whole separate separate beast. Um, you know, because these just don't happen that frequently. So you you've got to you've got to have a, a long history of, um, and maybe you can, you know, just keep information about only the extremes somehow in those analogs. And if you don't really if the rest of the weather is pretty average, you don't you don't really care about keeping that data around. But you could you could create some kind of collection of the extreme events, and then and then somehow use you know look ahead in the in the models and see where that matches the analog somehow in the forecast. Um, so yeah, it's it is probably the weakest part of that task. Trying to really get the extreme. Okay, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, so any other, uh, yeah, Kaspar again. Yeah, so I, I was thinking and was stimulated by your analysis of the change over time of the connectivity index. And from mm -hmm. a climate change perspective, this is, I think, really interesting but I, I'm wondering if it's structural. So if 
let's say for precipitation where we expect in a warmer environment, individual thunderstorms, individual rainfall events, at least having the potential of uh, producing more rainfall. Um, and as we are warming up during this period that you looked at, um, I'm wondering if every location around the country pretty much is has the potential of getting closer to the threshold that you have identified as an overall threshold through, throughout the period. And as you warm up, simply the potential to reach that threshold for precipitation can go up. The same probably would be for drought because it integrates over time and is balanced with, there's a balance between rainfall and temperature. So the evapotranspiration and so on. So for, for these factors and temperature then on top of everything even more so, you come closer to the threshold as you go through time. And that could mean that early in the period, it's structured events, frontal systems, it is uh, blocking highs and so on that define what the connectivity, typ typical connectivity in these extreme conditions look like. But as you go further, along the timeline towards the present, and then it would be as you go into the future, even more so, given the, the, look, the, the definition of your threshold that wouldn't adjust over time, um, that many more points are constantly closer to the threshold and therefore might start to show up. And therefore the connectivity of these individual points because it's now no longer tied to a, a, a single process, but it's everything is closer to the threshold, that connectivity might go down. So I was wondering if maybe that could be a path to look at and um, take a, a future run. If that were true, then this would, um, this would uh, you know, continue in, into the, throughout the 21st century. If you would take a daily series of a, of, of precipitation, let's say, from one of the, the global models. Yes, yes, it's a good, good observation. It's, it's a very interesting results and we uh, uh, definitely uh, should be looking at the climate models going forward to see, you know, first of all, if they can model this, uh, you know, special temporal process accurately, if they can, then certainly we could uh, look at the future run and see this uh, uh, trend is continuous or not. Um, I, I do gonna tell you that uh, I think uh, uh, we did extend this data set to 2020 and, uh, uh, and I think we started in uh, 1951 and the trend, this trend was still there. So this is kind of uh, encouraging and certainly still work in progress as far as uh, tidying up uh, this particular uh, observed trend uh, and uh, physical processes. Yeah, man, that's, that's, I think it's worth pursuing this a little bit and turning it into a message out there. That's very good. Thank you. Thanks, Vitaly. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Casper. Um, just looking to see if there are any hands raised. Uh, you know, we, there's still time for a question or two if anyone has. And it, but if not, then um, just thank Vitaly again. And uh, Roy, you unmuted. Did you have a? Yeah, I have a quick quick comment, not a question. Um, okay. This same technique could be used to look at some of our long term high resolution climate runs. So we have 40 year, four kilometers yes. over Conus. And there's no reason why you can't look at the model data in the same way to identify flood and drought events. And even look at trends. So I think that, that's be, right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is an interesting capability for lots of reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, thanks, Roy. And and I oh, saw. Um, there... I don't know. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, unless there unless there are any other questions. Um, I think we can I think we can wrap this up, but yeah, thank you, Vitaly, for, for a great seminar. And um, 
everyone here here in the in the Zoom room for a great discussion. So really appreciative of that. Um, just like to draw your attention also to the next RAL seminar coming up two weeks from today on May 5th. That will be given by Brian Argro from the University of Colorado, entitled Supercells to Supersonics, Aerospace Engineering Applied to Atmospheric and Weather Research. And you can find that information on the RAL Seminar Series webpage. You can just Google RAL Seminar Series and it will come right up. Um, but those of you uh, uh, who belong to RAL, you should have already gotten an email invitation to that seminar. So hope to see you there in two weeks. And if you would like to give a seminar or know of a colleague who, who you'd like to suggest or invite for a seminar, just um, you know, feel free to email me, jaredlee at ucar.edu, and we'd be happy to get you on the schedule. So thank you, everyone, and um, have a good rest of your afternoon. All right, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.